Welcome to Simulation-Based Learning in Public Health, a project of the National MCH Workforce Development Center housed at the Gilling School of Global Public Health at UNC Chapel Hill, the Georgia Health Policy Center, and Pontifex Consulting. This video will help you understand how simulation can support the learning needed to address complex challenges we now face. You'll learn where simulation can facilitate collaborative learning and how it works. We will conclude with two examples. The field of public health is faced with a number of complex problems that appear to be increasing in complexity. Public health professionals would love to have a ready-made approach for solving these problems, a checklist, if you will. But only some of what we face in the field and in life can be dealt with in that manner. These are what we call routine problems. They aren't routine because they happen regularly. They are routine because we have a fairly standard operating procedure for solving them. The problems are easily defined. The diagnosis is straightforward there's often an expert who has an answer. Think of these routine problems as falling on one end of a continuum. On the other end of the continuum, there are what Ron Heifetz from the Kennedy School of Government refers to as adaptive challenges, and these are an entirely different type of problem. Adaptive challenges are not well-defined. While experts can weigh in on the issue, most likely they disagree on what the problem really is. So there's not a single easily identifiable expert or group of experts to call to solve the problem. There's not a checklist to follow or ready-made solution, no protocol that can fix it. When looking at determinants of health, only 10% of the causes of lost life can be attributed to the delivery of health care services, which are mostly routine solutions to problems. However, working on behaviors, environments, and social circumstances, those are mostly adaptive. Most issues have a mix of routine and adaptive elements. There might be an evidence-based program for diabetes self-management. That's a routine solution. But getting people interested to learn about it and then to comply with it, well, that is the human element, the behavior change. That is almost entirely an adaptive problem. If a problem is routine, then there is no reason to wait to implement the solution. Just get out there and do it is the advice. But if the problem is adaptive, then the way to address it is to learn. A collaboratively orchestrated learning process can really benefit from a simulation modeling approach. In the field of health, most of the difficult issues we need to address are primarily adaptive challenges. There are often many people, many organizations trying to address these adaptive challenges from very diverse perspectives. This means they have different assumptions about what's going on and what to do about it. So, learning needs to be done in ways that get people on the same page about those assumptions. They need to develop a common picture, a mental map, to use in navigating this complex terrain. Systems thinking and system simulation can be a useful way to accomplish that, and it does so by helping us clearly identify and improve our assumptions about how the world works. In order to make sense of the complex world we live in, we all, build mental models, sets of assumptions that explain how things work. We use our mental models to intervene, to take action, by first mentally simulating how our decisions will impact the future, how they will unfold over time, then we choose how to act. Through the hard knocks of life, after several skinned knees and burned hands from touching metaphorical stoves, we eventually learn we face many challenges in our ability to build mental models, and that's where computer simulation can help. Let's illustrate with an example. Consider yourself in charge of managing the nursing staff at a hospital. Here's how staffing works at your hospital. One, there are two types of nurses, experienced and inexperienced. Two, there's a large number of experienced nurses. Three, for as long as you can remember, the same number of experienced nurses have quit each month. Four, your hiring policy is this. Immediately hire an inexperienced nurse to replace every experienced nurse that quits. Five, Put the inexperienced nurses into a training program that always makes them experienced in exactly six months. Six, your training is so good that no inexperienced nurse ever quits before becoming experienced. That is how it works at your hospital. Pretty simple, right? What if we add some new data? Assume that three months from now, there is a one-time increase in the rate at which experienced nurses quit each month. But the quit rate then stays at this new higher rate forever into the future. Here is the question. What future pattern for experienced nurses will result after this one-time step increase in the quitting rate? In other words, what will the trend line look like? This example has been used with thousands, from aerospace engineers to accountants to politicians, even with school kids. Here are the examples of the common patterns that participants come up with. Those projections are dramatically different in terms of implications. Some people see a potentially large problem looming, maybe a crisis. Others think, hey, it's no big deal. We will eventually recover. Why such a discrepancy? Because we have difficulty understanding how our assumptions work together. We don't know their interdependencies. And even if we do, we have difficulty simulating the implications. Although this staffing system is much simpler than what we encounter in the real world, we still get answers all over the map. Computer simulation can help us. One, agree on our assumptions and assemble them into a coherent mental model. 
and two, improve the quality of mentally simulating our mental models. By adding systems thinking, we can improve the quality of our mental models even more because reality is filled with many complex dynamics. There are time delays. We need to expand our boundaries of analysis. There can be unintended consequences that ripple out from our actions. There can be feedback loops interacting in ways that we don't fully understand, with vicious cycles or virtuous cycles possibly at play. In this example, when quitting jumps, hiring reacts immediately. But because of the delay, one of the system principles mentioned above, it takes a while before the increased hiring reaches the experienced. And now that we know what will happen, we can better determine what to do. If I were in charge of staffing at the hospital, I'd find out how many inexperienced nurses were finishing their training, how many were still in the pipeline, and then hire an appropriate amount above quitting to eventually catch up. But I wouldn't know to do that without testing and improving my mental model of the system I am managing. Computer simulation is helpful in doing that, and sometimes it may be the only way to do it. Computer simulation supports learning and helps us get on the same page. We already described how systems thinking improves the quality of thinking and ensures our efforts are more efficient. But let's talk about the added benefits of systems thinking based simulations. There are two powerful benefits to systems thinking. One is cognitive, the other emotional and behavioral. It is the combination of these two benefits that holds the power. On a cognitive intellectual basis, computer simulation helps identify high leverage. It helps us see what can be done that will fundamentally improve performance while avoiding unintended consequences. And with respect to the emotional and behavioral implications, systems thinking simulation increases the likelihood that we will respond, even under tremendous pressure, in ways that are high leverage. Leverage is a desirable, yet often elusive, aspect of being effective. I define leverage as the ability to fundamentally transform or improve the behavior of a system using minimal effort and resources and limiting negative unintended consequences. An example of leverage in real life is increasing health and fitness behaviors. This one change can improve productivity, reduce stress, increase mental sharpness and creativity, and extend life. There are few negative unintended consequences of this strategy. Simulation helps prepare us for what it will feel like in the moment of pressure and to see how our natural reactions are often counter to our desired objectives. John Sturman, professor of management at MIT, refers to simulations as low-cost laboratories for learning. Taking action in the real world can be messy and difficult, and the implications of our actions can take years, even decades, to unfold. Rather than wait 20 years to find our strategies don't work, we can use simulation to compress time and space and have greater confidence in our ability to see how the future will unfold. Just like problems can fall on a routine to adaptive continuum, how people view simulation models can also fall along a continuum. On one end of the continuum, some people say that models aren't useful because they aren't reality. The world is more complex than the model. The situation we face is unique, and even if a model was useful somewhere else, it's not useful to us. For simplicity, let's refer to this end of the continuum as cynics. They think models are useless. On the other end of the continuum are those who put an almost unwavering faith in models that if everything we know is built into the model, it will turn out the answers we need. If we put all the best wisdom about the financial markets into a model, we could predict stock market crashes. Let's call those on this end of the continuum the mystics. In the middle is a sweet spot, a place where the realists live. Realists understand that we are using our mental models all the time to make decisions and are by necessity modeling all the time. They understand the question isn't whether to model or not, but how to model in a way that clarifies our assumptions. They use modeling approaches, questions, maps, and simulations as a way to rigorously define, communicate, and test their assumptions. They have a healthy respect for simulations, seeing where they provide a very useful benefit. They own the approach to life by the famous statistician George Box. All models are wrong. Some are useful. So how are good systems thinking simulations built? Barry Richmond, a system dynamicist and simulation entrepreneur, describes the process with a diagram. Let's place issues along two dimensions. One dimension looks at the extent to which an issue is understood, from narrow to broad. Assume this scope covers both time and space. In other words, a broad approach to understanding would look at how an issue plays out over longer periods of time and across multiple sectors. Looking at health from a broad perspective would include understanding how health changes over decades and how it has population health, economic, and even public safety implications. Assume the other dimension is level of detail, from deep down in the weeds to a high level perspective, 30,000 foot level. Most mental models reside in the narrow and deep detail level. We tend to feel comfortable knowing a lot about a small aspect of a bigger issue. Most systems mental models would be broad and highly aggregated at the 30,000 foot level. The temptation to get to the systems level is to try to synthesize what everyone knows into one large complex model. 
The belief is that it takes everything we know about an issue to build systems understanding. This is usually a futile effort that becomes frustrating to those who undertake the endeavor. It could be considered taking the low road, perhaps the go-nowhere road. It's much easier to build a good system simulation model by getting up out of the weeds, taking a big picture perspective, and then adding enough detail and data to effectively understand the issue. That's how the following two examples were developed. In 2010, Georgia Health Policy Center was asked by the Georgia Department of Community Health to create a model to inform work in the state related to the high rate of low birth weight babies in Georgia. The department was trying to understand what types of policies might be helpful for addressing and reducing the amount of low birth weight occurring in the state, which has one of the higher rates in the country. With input from various public health professionals, they developed a framework for thinking about women falling into four different categories that may impact birth outcomes. These categories included whether or not they have a viable reproductive plan, and whether or not they are at risk for having a low birth weight outcome. By dividing up the population into those four buckets, we have women of childbearing age with or without reproductive plans who are at risk or not at risk for a low birth weight outcome. We then asked, if we were able to move women from one of these categories to another, which might be the most effective in reducing low birth weight outcomes? If we have women without plans, do we move them up to having plans? Or, if we could move women who are at risk over to not be at risk, what impact would that have? When using a simulator with a group, we often ask people to sketch out what they think will happen. This forces them to consider what an impact an intervention or policy may have on outcomes before they pull the lever on the model. It turns out that moving women from the at-risk category to the not-at-risk category didn't have much of an impact. Given current understanding about whether or not somebody has a plan or not, there isn't a huge difference in terms of the outcomes given the particular population and the statistics we're using. Next, we could look at reducing chronic conditions and seeing what impact it has on reducing low birth weight. Another lever that we put in here was what would happen if we improve the effectiveness for reproductive plans. What if we assume women have a reproductive plan and we also get them to comply more by taking folic acid and doing some of the other health behaviors that they should do prior to getting pregnant? If we even slightly improve the effectiveness of a person's existing reproductive plan, we see that there appears to be significant birth outcome improvement. This indicates there's not as much to be gained by differentiating categories of women as much as if you could increase the effectiveness for women who already have reproductive plans. If you could get packaged information through the health system to more of those women, then you could have more of an impact. And this wasn't completely obvious prior to modeling. A second example is related to malnutrition in Peru. An important health issue in many developing countries concerns malnutrition. The World Bank manager, John Newman, worked with the Peruvian government and several humanitarian organizations to take a more systemic approach to malnutrition. Working with a group of these organizations, we developed a model to have more rigorous dialogue about different strategies to reduce malnutrition. The model assumes that children can be born at a healthy weight or on track. They can also be born off track or malnourished. Then as they age, they can either stay on track become malnourished, stay malnourished, or become on track again. This model aggregates into several age categories, zero to six months, six months to two years, and two to six years. Let's look at how children can be on either track. The health of mothers is a huge contributing factor as to whether a child is born at a healthy weight. If on track, the amount and quality of breastfeeding can determine the likelihood an infant will stay on track. Children can still fall off track if they become sick with diarrhea and have days when they don't get full nutrition. The longer children are ill, the more likely they will become severely malnourished. The ability to receive quality medical treatment during and immediately following illness can improve an infant's chances of returning to a properly nourished level. Once an infant turns six months, the ability to stay well nourished depends on the amount of food available per family as well as a family's knowledge of nutrition. Again, falling ill can harm nutrition levels, while medical attention can improve them. The same factors apply for those in the two to six year old category. The model looks at several policies to impact these various causes. We will run the model to set a do nothing baseline, assuming that the same rates of malnutrition persist into the future. A popular humanitarian strategy is to give more food to families. The impact of this strategy is limited because the food usually goes to the older members of the family who are working and supporting the family in some way. Another strategy is to intervene when children are very young. Again, this seems like a very humane thing to do, but it's limited in impact. 
It turns out that improving breastfeeding can put a child on a good trajectory from the start. But the place where many children fall off track is during the six months to two year window when they become sick. It would be high leverage to apply interventions in this age range in order to keep children healthy or get them the medical help they need to return to health. Finally, malnutrition could be reduced if there were an improved knowledge among families of what constitutes proper nutrition. The simulation helped humanitarian organizations to see that they needed to shift from providing food to educating and to helping intervene at the right ages to keep children from falling off track during the critical age range of six months to two years. Simulation models aren't predictions of the future. They are useful because they allow us to integrate and improve our collective assumptions about how things work. Using systems thinking principles helps us to improve both the rigor and realism of the models. We use mental models all the time to make decisions. We have to, but none of them are perfect. None. For that matter, neither are our computer models. But through a process of becoming less and less wrong, by applying the curiosity and rigor of a scientist, we can improve our thinking using simulation. We can help others to lean into a process of careful analysis, wanting to learn and contribute to the adaptive challenges we face. And step by step, we can develop the insight needed to find leverage and make the world a healthier place, increasing the well-being of all.